Hello and welcome to today's A-Team Group webinar on best practices for metadata management. My name is Sarah Underwood, I'm an editor at A-Team Group and I will be moderating today's webinar. Our expert speakers today are Michael King, Director Enterprise Data Governance at BNY Mellon, Edgar Zalait, Chief Data Architect Americas at Deutsche Bank, Tara Raffat, Semantic Metadata Architect at Bloomberg, Philip Miller, co-CEO and co-founder at Solidatus, and Mark Etherington, Chief Technology Officer at Crux. I'll ask the speakers to introduce themselves in a couple of minutes, but first a little bit of information so that you can uh, make the best of the webinar. To the right of your video, you will see uh, two uh, columns. One is for uh, polls, and we'll be running three polls throughout the webinar, so do please vote in that. It's useful to gauge interest and uh, where people are in our metadata topic today. The other one is for questions. You can put any questions you like there to the speakers, and I'll pick those up and try and answer as many as we can through the webinar. We won't leave them until the end, otherwise we won't have time. So please do put your questions there whenever you uh, have one, and we'll answer as many as we can. Okay, enough of me, and over to our speakers. Mike, please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your interest in metadata. Good morning and good afternoon to everybody who's on the webinar. I'm Mike King. I am the Director of Enterprise Data Governance Technology for BNY Mellon Bank. And uh, I'm happy to be here, happy to answer all questions and talk all things data governance and, and uh, metadata management. Thank you very much. And coming to you, Edgar. Yes, hi, uh, I'm Edgar Zalit. I'm the Chief Data Architect for the Americas for Deutsche Bank. Um, been in this field for quite a bit, probably 10 years now. And uh, it's really interesting time as we're getting into artificial intelligence and machine learning applying everywhere and a lot of data analytics and all the hot buzzwords, but fundamentally it's the data architecture and it's all the metadata around that that really makes it all work. So I look forward to live the conversation and uh, look forward to your questions. Thanks. Thank you. And Tara. Hi everyone, I'm Tara Rafat, I'm joining you from New York this morning. Um, I'm a semantic technology specialist. I have joined Bloomberg about six months ago as part of their CTO office to strategize their semantic yeah. metadata management. And prior to that, I have worked with multiple companies and working specifically with introduction of semantic metadata um, into different fields such as finance, healthcare, um, industrial symbiosis, and um, I'm really excited to be here with you today. Thank you. Philip. Hi, I'm Philip Miller. I'm co-CEO with my um, great friend and colleague, Philip Dutton at Solidatus. Um, I, I guess my interest in metadata comes from trying to, trying to quantify and use it. So 20 years in investment banking, IT, um, running some very large, um, very, very important to their organizations, uh, projects around regulation. Uh, and finding that as an institution, uh, the, the companies just didn't really understand what they were about. They knew what they wanted to do, but you know, amnesia or, or, or needing specialists all the way through wasn't really good enough. So I'm, I, I guess I'm a technologist turned, um, turned metadata, data geekerist. Okay, well, we'll come back to you on that. Uh, Mark, coming to you, please. That's fine. Hi, sir. Thanks very much. Uh, as Sarah said, I'm, the, I'm Mark Edempton. I'm the CTO of Crux Informatics. Uh, we're a data integration company offering services like pipelines as a service, but we specialize in third party data. Uh, I've been in uh, finance more years than I'd like to admit, candidly. Um, spent a long time at JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, and Refinitiv before joining Crux. Uh, my interest in, mar in metadata is really how to help our clients use the underlying data better and actually to help shape it to their needs and actually obviously the suppliers' needs as well. Looking forward to the conversation. Thank you all, and let's get on with that conversation. And coming to you first, Tara, please would you kind of set the scene and tell us a little bit about the evolution of metadata and why it's become so important? Oh, absolutely. Well, um, I guess that was metadata, the famous data about data. So um, I think we can go back into history and start talking about metadata from where it was just tags that were attached to different um, scrolls at the time of the Alexandria Great, the libraries that they had and the way they wanted to actually um, organize their information and organize basically their scrolls and finding it. So it really like the word terminology itself can go back really long into history. But I think it was around 19... Um, 
1967 that it was it was introduced into the whole computer science world. And um, the truth is metadata have been really playing a transformative role in how we interact with information today. And we're doing it in our everyday life. Like every day we're looking at a Google Maps, we're doing searches on Amazon, we're getting recommendations from Netflix. And we can really see the enormous role that this metadata is playing in um, different organizations. And it really allows us to add a way more granular level of detail to the information and data that we want to be interacting with. And I think one of the most evident use cases that we're seeing everywhere today is around search and discovery. However, um, with the explosion uh, of the volume and the variety of data that we're seeing within organizations today, whether it's in their different applications, different environments, um, different um, platforms, metadata management has become more and more diverse and dynamic. So um, we're really different, dealing with a lot of different types of metadata in different forms and shapes. And that's why uh, we're seeing the importance of having an enterprise-wide uh, metadata management system and that becoming really crucial. And one little thing that I would just touch upon as part of the evolution that is very interesting to me personally, because it's in my area of semantics, is really the emergence of semantic technologies for metadata management and how that is allowing for defining metadata in a contextualized, interlinked and machine understandable way and really allowing for us to have a very comprehensive enterprise-wide data management, metadata management system. Excellent. Thank you. Edgar, what would you add there in terms of evolution and the current importance of metadata? Yeah, um, I've been in the industry for more years than I also care to admit. And I do remember those scrolls back in Alexandria, but but I do want to I do want to spin forward a little bit, kind of, you know, set the context. Right. Um, I mean, back in the day in, in the 1990s. Right. If we all remember, or at least we I do. Um, we started to get data sets, we processed them, we sent them on, it was great. There was a limited amount of data, you couldn't get most of the stuff you needed, but the users pretty much knew what it was they had. They didn't have to deal with a lot of questions about what this is, because you know, um, Joe over in uh, over in accounting sent me this data, I do my forecasting, I pass it on to Sarah over in, in risk management, that was all good. So move forward, big data, cloud, type of uh, capabilities come around and all of a sudden we think there's gonna be data everywhere. This is great. We're gonna be floating in data. There's never gonna be that challenge of where to get my data, right? We're living in the in Nirvana. Well, not so fast, because this is where we get into the, all the issues of, well, but what is this data? I mean, how do I use it? Is this, I have 20 different data sets to give me pricing, which one should I use? So this is where metadata comes in, right? Metadata really gives you the specifics about, excuse me, gives you the specifics about what all that data you have now, how do you use it? What does it mean? How do you integrate it? How do you consolidate it? When should you use it? When you should you not use it, right? Uh, so basically what we want to do with metadata is we want to describe what makes the data usable, findable, understandable, um, and that sets you up for all the really cool stuff like uh, machine learning, AI, analytics, all that stuff. If you don't know what you're using to generate your forecast outputs, the forecast outputs aren't really going to be very useful, right? So I, I just want to touch one more. If I have, if I have more moments, Sarah, I want to touch on the, the definition of metadata. So Tara, spot on, right? We all know data. It's data about data. But you know what? What does that really mean, right? And this is where I, I kind of think of this in a couple of major sort of areas you need to understand. First of all, to Sarah's point, you need to understand the semantics. And I'll take an easy example, right? So maybe to walk through this price, right? Everybody understands what price is. That that's not a that's not a hard thing. Well, but is it right? Because when you get into a into a security pricing, you, well, what is this price? Is this end today? Is this intraday? Is this bid, ask, mid, execution price, last price? Um, all the, you have to understand the semantics of what do you really mean by price. So when you're putting together something much more complicated than perhaps price, you need to understand how to consolidate information. Next, you need to understand provenance and metadata needs to capture the provenance. In other words, where did you get this from? Um, so for example, price, is this our valuation? Is this an external quote? Well, where do we get the external quote from? Was it from Bloomberg? Was it from Reuters? Uh, was it from you know, some other source, right? 
uh, how old is the price? Today's price, yesterday's price, intraday price, end of month, right? So the provenance starts becoming very important. And this is where you get into the really real import of lineage, understanding how the data you're looking at here, how it got here, what are all the intermediate steps it went through to make sure who touched it or who didn't touch it. Then third area is structure. Um, this is probably more technical, but this includes things like uh, decimals, is it fractional price, is it currencies? I used to work, I spent many years at the New York Stock Exchange when we traded in eighths, right? If, if you folks remember that. So we actually moved data around that was priced in eighths, not in, not in decimal dollars, right? Um, domain value is very important. Um, what are the possible values of your flags? And then follow, and finally, it's qualifiers, things that you need to worry about, sort of broad category of um, security, PII, does the data contain NPI, need to know sensitivity, all those things. And all this collectively, to my mind, fits into metadata. And if you kind of think through those categories, you can understand that if you really want to use the massive amounts of data at your fingertips, you have to deal with all that stuff and understand it. Thank you. We'll come back to some of those uh, points you've made um, as we go along in the webinar. But uh, next, let's run an audience poll. The question is, how mature is the use of metadata management at your organization? While you answer the question, let me come to Philip to describe best practice metadata management and its challenges and solutions. Well, I think Edgar's done a, a fantastic job of, uh, uh, of describing a whole heap of uh, the, the advantages uh, of, of metadata. And I, 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 I find it hard to, to better that. I think without going back to the libraries of Alexandria um, uh, and, and, and looking at how they classified scrolls, but, but bringing that forward into, into the current day, and, and I guess putting one of my favorite analogies against things, right? So you're never sick until you see a doctor, right? When you understand data, it's, it's a simple question, right? When do you understand data? It, it's great having these big data environments around, but you actually have to have that epiphany that you need to understand what the data is doing in context. And so the very first part of best practice is to have that recognition that, that the data itself isn't as usable until you can put it to work properly and make it reusable. And so the first challenge really is to, is to start putting that semantic uniqueness against a piece of data. So bid, mid, ask, you know, all of this stuff actually recognizing that there's there's root terminology um, that that root terminology can in different contexts mean different things I you know you, you can use price but I, I prefer to, 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 to think of client records as something that's much more if you like widely understood a client or an entity or a party they they're all at the root the same type of thing but in context they mean different things I could have a client and a client of my client so for me, the first part of the first part of um, enterprise, as Tara said, enterprise um, metadata management, enterprise data management, is getting together all of your subject matter experts and starting to get out of their brains the context behind the terminology that they're using, and getting that put down into you know, a store of record or um, you know, a, a solution that at least is enterprise fit, so that everyone in the enterprise can benefit from everyone else's information that they have and the context that they have. Um, recently, I was having a discussion with a colleague about a, a retailer and they have lots of different outlets and they have different contexts behind the outlets and they sell broadly similar things, but each of the outlets has its own, uh, its own person for laying out the stock and the shelves. And they are experts at that particular part of their enterprise, but as a whole enterprise, they don't really have an understanding how the data should be used that would help them inform the whole enterprise. So, so for me, it's understanding you have a metadata challenge because everyone does. If you have data, you have a metadata challenge. And it is then getting all of the information that makes metadata usable out of people's heads and into an enterprise repository that is usable by anyone in the enterprise for the betterment of the enterprise and its customers. Okay, Mark, how would you like to describe best practice? Um, well, the, the first thing is I completely agree with Philip. I think that the, the point here is self-awareness as well, yeah? I mean, so the interesting thing from, from my perspective as I look at this is the self-awareness is really, really important. The other thing to realize here is it doesn't matter how well you define your metadata, the interpretation of that metadata needs to be soft. And frankly, most of our code bases in the world are not soft, yeah? 
So they're in a position where you, even if you've marked a price at a given thing, my guess is there's a rule in the trading system that actually is more hard coded than you would like. So you know, increasing your focus on metadata is absolutely essential if you're going to dig your way out of this longer term problem. But there's a long way to go here in terms of the, you know, just getting into the, the practice yourselves of doing this. Now, it gets really interesting in terms of the question is like best practice. I'm not sure there is that much. There are some good practices out there. I don't think it's established itself as a full blown discipline. It's fantastic to see Tara's title, to be honest. Yeah, I suspect that's fairly rare in the industry, to be honest. And it's all about the semantics. So for, if I was looking at a couple of rule of thumbs, if someone asked me this, it's like, first of all, look, understand why what you're looking at and why. Why are you capturing things? Because metadata is extremely wide. Yeah, market uh, in term a uh, set of definitions, to be honest. And there's a load of different layers that you could get into, and some of them are easy, and some of them are actually quite hard. The second point is actually, again, it's a little bit less abstract, but be thoughtful about where you capture it. I mean, there's a lot of data architecture has been around for many, many years. Yeah. Some of the adages and practices in there, a lot of them, in fact, are very applicable in this space as well. Where do you capture the data? Capture it upstream, for instance don't change it downstream. All of the rules about metadata itself, put good data practices around your metadata. And then the last I would say is use it. If you don't use it, it will decay. And it doesn't matter you think it's clean. If you don't use it, you don't have that feedback loop for consumers actually taking that data and using the thing. So if it's a calendar and your it's, it's, that's proper data, if there's a calendar of metadata on that, that goes around it, if you don't use the metadata to interpret what's going on in the calendar, that calendar will decay. It doesn't matter what you do. And this is an adage across pretty much all of systems. So use it or lose it, um, but definitely understand why you're doing it to start with. Thank you. Mike, would you like to add anything to that? Sure, I'll just be brief. So there are really kind of, to me, five best practices that we deployed at BY Mellon, and then five challenges that I'd like to talk about <clears throat> very briefly. So. In terms of best practices, what we've done is we've created a, uh, a kind of a consortium between the functional business and the technology teams so that we can administer, understand, and deploy the metadata because we have over 1,900 applications or systems within the bank that do a variety of different things for each of the different lines of business. So the first thing is, is understanding that a metadata description, an information, or an element of data in one line of business Mean, mean something completely different. It could be a synonym or homonym, depending on if you go to another line of business, issue with services versus private wealth management versus asset servicing, and so on. Uh, the second thing is define a metadata strategy. I often find that folks jump right to the tools before they even understand what their strategy is. The third thing is adopt the metadata standards. So this could be things like, um, you know, what are the standard, you know, if you have a, a common definitional element, uh, it can be, is it, the, is it the same thing? Is it different? Is it, you know, is it the same name? So ISIN, you know, here and ISIN there, or is it like account number or account NO? You know, those kinds of things down to the elemental level. And then deploy the metadata management tools. So what we've done is we've, we've deployed a cluster of tools like catalog, glossary, so glossary around the business rules about, you know, business definitions and so on. Uh, we have lineage and, you know, uh, Phil talked about, Phil talked about, I'm sorry, uh, Edgar talked about provenance of data. So you know, we use our lineage tools to inform internally as well as externally. We call them reconnaissance tools because we do more things than just provenance. We look at things like where's an element going, it, coming from outside the four walls, internally to the bank and external as well. Uh, for things like regulatory programs like MIFID II and BCBS 239. And we even used it for things like LIBOR, uh, determination where LIBOR rates were to go to the SOFA rates, the AR rates. And then finally, you know, from the best practices, expand that mass that 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 metadata management to the entire enterprise. Use your data governance operating model that in, that informs and, and deploys met, metadata management, not just in one line of business or ten or five, whatever it is, across the entire entire enterprise. And as far as challenges that we've seen personally is that this this there's really this everybody knows that disparate uh, information sources. And the data tends to be very complicated, very complex. So you have to kind of get your hands around that. Um, the second one, and probably more difficult than anything else, is enforcing rules. You find that folks hold on to these rules probably more tightly than they do even things like you know, the difference between a, 
you know, one BI tool versus another. It somewhat turns to be, tends to be religious wars, if you will, around who really owns the definition of a particular data element. Then when we're talking about metadata here, we're really talking about the element itself, the element, the physical element, the critical element, you know, which, you know, which, you know, which of those, who owns that critical element, who owns the authoritative data sources, what those elements really re represent, and then, then creating that view, the enterprise-wide view, so that we can all speak the same language. We talked about Alexandria. Let's talk about the Rosetta Stone. We have one line of business calling it one thing, another line of business calling it something else. Let's come, come up with a common definition so we can all talk around the same, same language, same lexicon. Um, and so and then the third thing is lack of good processes around metadata management. So I, you know, I've seen a number of organizations. I'm a BNY Mellon Bank, been there for a while, but I've also been at Goldman Sachs. I've been at, with IBM. So I've spent a lot of time with the Wells Fargo's of the world, the JPMC's and so on. What I come to find when I look across the enterprise, especially within financial services, is it's really the same theme just repeated over and over again, which is there's really not a great handle on the, pra the practition of and the process around metadata management. And then finally, mitigating security and privacy risks, specifically around entitlement, understanding which of your elements are critical, who can see it, wh where is your HCI or highly confidential information, and which information is PII, personally identifiable. Once you've gotten those pieces together and you've beaten those challenges, there are more, but those are really the top five challenges and really the top five best practices. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you all. Uh, let's have a look, if we may, at the poll results and let's see where our audience is. Great, Philip, would you like to comment on these? 71% uh, saying uh, somewhat mature, 18, not very mature, mature, sorry, 12%, very mature. So yeah, what do you reckon? So somewhat mature is probably sort of understanding the problem. And I think that's probably where the majority are now. I think if we'd have asked that question 18 months ago, I'll pick 18 as quite a sort of specific 18, 19 months ago, because that's that's before our current pandemic. I think that you would have found a very different answer. Uh, I think I think, you know, the last year and a half has really piqued people's interest in, in understanding how to use the data. Uh, because working practices have changed so much that they've been kind of pushed into it. We've talked before, Sarah, about the thing that I think has been the most disruptive influence in the world. Is it the CEO, the CI, the CDO or COVID-19? And I think that that's probably pushed that, that answer to being slightly more mature than it was a year and a half ago. OK, thank you very much indeed for that. And uh, let's run another audience poll, see what you think of this one. The question is, what are the key use cases of metadata management at your organization? And you can tick as many of the boxes as you like. While you do that, uh, let me come to Mark to hear his thoughts about key uses of metadata in capital markets. Sure, thanks, Aaron. Um Well, I guess it depends which level. And, you, and organizations may not know they're using metadata. They're just using information in a lot of cases. So if you go to like the bottom of the stack, I mean, think about yeah, the, it, it, without all of the definitions around metadata, think of it as like the reference data that describes what you're doing. Now, if you think about it in that context, operational data is really, really key. I mean, how do you run your firm if you don't know when to run your pipelines? Yeah, if you don't know when the data is supposed to be available versus when it's not. And that generates a lot of noise in organizations. So there's a whole fundamental set of, if you like, reference data about how to get the data that you're interested in, how to manage that, and how to do that efficiently from your own organization's perspective. You don't want people chasing down feeds that actually don't appear today because their calendars are wrong. I think the, the next key point from, from my perspective is if when you've got a semantic scheme, and some of this is, is the use cases you can do if you had. So if you actually had a semantic scheme, and not, not a database scheme, but something that actually gave you, as a, uh, I think, basically as Mike raised, like cross-references, knowing that an ISIN is an ISIN, a CEDAW is a CEDAW, a QSIP is a QSIP, you can start to do more interesting things about actually how you join that data together. And you start to get into a point where you can actually provide assistance tools to your data engineering and data science groups versus actually you hiring more people. So there's an efficiency play there as well. Working out how to join data together if you've got metadata is significantly easier. What's the time period of the data that you're looking at? And I don't just mean you know, from 1902. It's like, is it quarterly? Is it monthly? And the core point that comes out of that is actually similar to Edgar's example, because 
If you think about a unit change, I suspect that everybody on this call has been exposed to a unit changing when you didn't know, when either the supplier didn't tell you, somehow that notification got lost in the, uh, the inbox in the mailroom, yeah, despite being whatever email system you're on. But they happen. So how do you actually do notifications of metadata? And there are no standards around this. There's lots of things that we're talking about. Like if you've been in any of the finance bigger companies, FIX is a good standard. It's a pseudo standard. SWIFT is about apparently the only real solid standard out there. You've got things like FPMO and the like. But cross-referencing between all of these and actually showing that that is a security ID and it's called tag X in FIX and you know group Y in this standard is really important if you want to do cross-group. And it's also well and good within a firm. But if you're translating, firms don't live in isolation. So translating between suppliers, translating between firms, translating to the market is extremely important as well. If you can do that, you'll get more efficiency. There's a higher level of this. And that, this is why I was a little bit surprised that 12% think they're very mature. Yeah, either they, there's a very informed you know, audience on this as well, because what you, you, if you're interested in this topic, you're here. Yeah, so when you look at it, modeling relationships between data sets is extremely important. This was touched on a little bit earlier. If you know what the relationships are, whether it's just a version relationship, which allows you to actually do an abstraction so you don't get, you, your systems don't crash when a new version turns up unexpectedly, a little surprise for you Monday morning. Yeah, whether you're actually trying to model it. Now think about, you know, uh, I mean, Goldman's is actually uh, open source legend. So that's going to take some traction in the market to really get going. But that's actually a higher level again. That's about actually how to model transactions and data, how to think about data as a, as a more abstract level. Now, why do that? Because you can then code to it. You can provide an abstraction, which means your code maintenance base cost drops. You can insulate your users from change management issues. Think backward compatibility on data set versions. And you'll be able to learn actually how to join data together, together easier without actually going through having to have an engineer doing it. Think about you know, deltas and snapshots, you know, a Sunday night dump of the security master with updates every day from your well-known suppliers. How do you give a holistic view? That's a problem that everybody solves. Now, metadata could actually make that a lot easier if you actually knew the relationships between this. So I think that there's a, there's a myriad of uses, some of which are, you know, are being done, but not really viewed as metadata, and others which are potentials that could be done providing you actually have the repo, the, the repository of knowledge, knowledge graph, as we call it, to actually understand what the data actually is doing. Okay. Edgar, what would you add there in terms of uh, use cases? Yeah, I think, I think Mark hit a lot of the highlights of what happens in capital markets, especially, you know, the operational metadata. This is the stuff we've been living for, living with since the inception of computing inside probably capital markets, right? Um, and absolutely true that without that, you struggle and those changes that come along in the sources that aren't well communicated downstream. And by the way, those could be probably are more even internal changes than external changes to Mark's point, right? The, the unit change, right? Uh, there's even more internal changes, um, identifier change, a different structure on, on contract IDs for loans, whatnot, right? And those need to be communicated well. Um, I, I also think of the, the current usage, where we're going these days and what metadata really is enabling, right? The, the new uses really are when you, the more broadly you need to pull data together for some application, some new thing you want to do, the more important the metadata becomes, right? If I go to the repo desk and I ask them for data, they give me all their repo positions, et cetera. Okay, great. They describe all the data. It's all good. We know the data. That's pretty useful if I'm going to process, I'm going to generate forecasts for that. And that, that's, that's a nice thing. And we've been doing that for a long time. However, if I now need to go across, you know, a hundred different asset classes across hundred different geographies and everybody needs to send me something so I can do a bank-wide uh, risk-weighted asset calculation. Now, all of a sudden that much more broader sourcing of data means that everybody, and again, Mark, Mark raises, but everybody's gonna think of their definitions slightly differently. They're gonna think of their stuff as slightly different range of applicability, right? Oh, well, that particular attribute only applies to commercial loans. That's not really a residential loan attribute. 
But until you get into the better use of metadata, you won't know that. So, so to my mind, the more broadly you need to pull data together, the more significant and more impactful is a good understanding and management of metadata. So what does that practically mean? That means risk management, you know, uh, probably the most important thing that a global bank like Deutsche Bank does is risk management, right? Because that's what keeps us in business to trade again tomorrow or, or, or play again tomorrow, right? Uh, but improving risk management always means getting more and more data, getting better information, getting broader sources of information. Again, classic use of metadata. Um, regulatory reporting, our regulators across the world. Yeah, US maybe was most intense, but Europe's certainly catching up. Uh, Asia PACs also very intense on regulation. They want more and more granularity, more and more visibility. We need to pull, pull together more and more broadly sourced data sets. And again, without the metadata, that consolidation is error prone and problematic. And I think the big thing now, you know, sort of on the um, on the offensive side, as opposed to defensive side, right, uh, is all the forecasting we're talking about. You know, this is any of your analytics, any of your AIs, any analytic where things come from. Um, here, you really need to get into an understanding because there, you're always going to be coming up with a new forecast. It's, it's kind of like I, I worked for a while with uh, algorithmic models of, of, uh, of uh, pricing in, in the securities industry, right, and in, in, uh, equity trading. And bottom line is, once your model works, it's good for about nine months. And then the other guys have caught up and you priced it out of the market, right? So what that means is you're constantly improving, you're constantly bringing in new data, you're constantly looking at new analytics. Again, without the metadata, you have no idea how to integrate that. Uh, so those are, that's kind of in the broad, broad scope, the way we think about it, right? And really what you need to get that done, you need to, you need to understand the controls. Who, who said this data is good, right? How, how did they say it? Did they did they kind of scan across the 20,000 columns of data and said, yeah, it looks about right? Or did they go line by line and attribute by attribute? So how can I rely on this stuff? What's the quality? Are there blanks? Are there missing pieces? Are the prices approximate? Are they sometimes you know, not available? Lineage, key, key thing. Where did this come from? Okay, uh, the price of this stock is 100.23. Who says, right? Where did this come from? Very important to understand. Sources, applicability. Applicability is a key one. Uh, where can I use this? Where can't I use this particular data? So as you're pulling in new data sets into existing usage or into new usage, right? You need to understand all those aspects of metadata so you can use it properly and get the value you're looking for. Because otherwise, if you're forecasting wrong, you can you can drive business results in a very bad direction. So that's that's really the key role of metadata. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, Edgar. And if we may, may we, can we see the poll results, please? Okay, Tara, would you like to uh, comment on uh, those results? Um, sure, yes. Um, I think data governance kind, kind of stands in, in high because um, just going back to Philip's point as well, it's, it's one, I think it's been one of the major results of the shift that the pandemic has created in, in the way that we're working, basically creating all these distributed working models. Um, and um, that means that our whole data governance had to be seen from a different perspective. And um, a, the, the complexity of the data journey that has been created because before we're people sitting in one place data sitting in one central place being controlled environments um and diff like easier control over who's going to access it as opposed to now people working from so many different um places within the world data traveling you know through so many different channels um and like data sitting in one country you accessing it from a different country all these factors started playing um, a huge role in the way um, companies started seeing their data governance. And I think that's why it's like sort of created a peak in, in the use of um, metadata for, for data governance and, and lineage as well. Um, so I'm not kind of surprised to see that standing out as the, the highest, to be honest. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you for voting. And uh, staying with you, Tara, and uh, we've spoken a little bit about lineage and obviously governance. How can... Uh, metadata and metadata management be used well for these particular functions and what benefits can they deliver? Sure, yeah, so, so just following up on what I was saying, like we see that the journey of the data is becoming more and more complex and 
um, still we kind of need a much more flexible and kind of hybrid model of governance to, to allow um, people to access data. Um, but that's where like the whole metadata becomes really, really important. I think uh, right now people sort of categorize this sort, sort of metadata for provenance and lineage under operational metadata, right? So when it comes to the whole security um, aspect of it, you're trying to capture things like who is accessing my data, where are they residing, where is the data, what's their level of um, authority that they have so there's so many different factors that are going to play into the rules and entitlements that you're going to define for accessing that that data which is all captured in the context of metadata so so that's really what what we call metadata in this um, scenario and the other thing is by defining these factors as metadata you would be able to attach different levels of rules um, to, to your data, which means like that could be rules from regulatory rules such as GDPR. So any PII kind of data, whether you're allowed to access it or not, that could be actually attached to the level of the data element itself, as opposed to necessarily just the whole data set um, or, or a big database. So you can go as deep as the uh, piece of data itself, or you can actually attach um, um, the rules for expiry of data, uh, um, like the expiration rules to the pieces of data um, as well. And I think one, one other important thing, which Edgar touched upon um, uh, as well very uh, excessively is the whole data life cycle and capturing everything that happens to your piece of data from where it enters your ecosystem within your organization until it, it reaches the end user, right? So there is so many transformation logic that happens to your piece of data that you would necessarily need to capture. And this transformation could be made by a system or could be made even by humans. Um, so all of that needs to be captured. Why? Well, there's so many different uses, but I think the two ones that we touched upon is from um, regulatory compliance. You really need to have a very comprehensive audit trail of your data these days, especially in the financial world. So when regulators come tomorrow and ask you, why did you make this decision when you made it? You really have to have an accurate snapshot of data in that specific moment of time when you are dealing with that data to say, hey, this is the information that was available to me. This is where I got it from. And that's how I came to this decision. Um, and also the other thing is, you throughout this journey, you're creating all these linkages of data between the, the, the piece of data and the systems that are either using it or transforming it. So uh, in the future, if there's any sort of um, disruption um, or in, in your data in terms of availability, in terms of credibility and quality, you would it would be much easier for you to uh, trace this data to all these different systems that will be affected by this sort of disruption. Um, so I think these are, again, there's so many more of it, but I wanted just to touch upon these two very specific areas of metadata for capturing lineage and how it's used and for security and access. Thank you. Philip, what would you say here in terms of metadata, lineage and governance? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> no I'm going to try and be a bit pithy here. I, mm. so, so I spent 10 years doing regulatory reporting um, and I regulators only regulate what they have to regulate, right? They, they don't really want to stifle the market. They're not looking to do things that they don't need to do. But the market, if we're talking about financial services, needed regulation. It was doing things they didn't understand. Are they looking for accuracy? Are they looking for quality? Yes, of course they are. But one of the things they're checking for is consistency. Now, I think if you ask the question to the regulator, what are you going to go after first? It's going to be, well, I'm going to look for telltales that you don't understand, you know what you're doing. And consistency is going to be one of those areas. If I go and, and say, I want these, um, I want these five different reports. And actually, across those different reports, there's, there's a common element. And if three of those reports say one thing on that common element, common element and, and two of them say something different, you're going to ask why. It, it, it's going to come to lineage. Am I getting the right data into the right field and using it for the right purpose? And, and to Tara's point, am I making the right decisions on, on, um, on the information I'm being presented? Consistency is what's going to get you in jail first. Without understanding your lineage, you're going to get into trouble. 
And metadata is the key to understanding your lineage and getting your provenance right. So in, in terms of what it can deliver as a benefit, it's going to deliver many, many things, you know, good decisioning and everything else. But essentially, the first question you will answer for regulatory reporting to give that to give that example is it'll give you that consistent result. OK, thank you very much indeed for that, Philip. And uh, let's stick with some of the tech talk, Mark. And could you explain, please, how data management practitioners can kind of start and scale metadata management projects? So if you can just have a slightly shorter answers now, otherwise we're going to run out of time, I fear. <laughs> <Okay>. no <problem. laughs> thank you. All right. So um, uh, let's get to some of the quick. Yeah. So I agree with with. You know, I think Mike actually went through a very sound structure earlier on for what they've been doing. So the core of this, how do you get going? Yeah, Clear vision and target. Why are you doing this? It really does drive your focus. Not everyone's focus is exactly the same. Obviously, for, you know, banks may want to have regulatory reporting, you know, be much more efficient. That's fair. But not everyone does. You know, for us, our job is much more about making data digestible for our clients and then easy for them to translate or enhance and aggregate. So it's a slightly different focus. If you don't know your focus, you're going to struggle with your project. Now, depending on your organization, and it, yeah, again, large or small, you need somebody that really understands the potential here and is a champion that can drive and put that into the organizations. Now, we all have different organizations and different ways of executing, but you're going to need a leader and you're going to need a small team that can focus on this. Yeah? I don't think it has to be large but you need insight. So it's more likely you're going to have some data scientists in those type of teams and someone that understands data not modeling, which isn't necessarily the same. There's a lot of overlap. Then you are necessary data engineers. So you want people that actually with the thinking about the data of the data and how to actually really use it as well as the practitioners. And then whatever you need to do, you've got to create a repo of some form. Now you might already be using third party uh, cataloging, but you're going to need to get to the point, I think, where I personally would always start with the schema and the dictionary and the catalog. Start with something that you can get your arms around to actually understand what, they, what you've got. If you don't actually know what's in the organization, you're not likely to be able to actually make much progress with the metadata. So that a lot of firms have started with actually just cataloging what's out there. And then establish what or define what you think your end state really is. So that comes back to the vision, but it's broad brush and then define your first couple of iterations. Now for us, we started with cross-referencing. We wanted to be able to identify, one of the examples earlier, security identifier. We had no easy way of saying that across uh, you know, field tags or naming conventions and data frames are different from many different providers. How did we get a ubiquitous definition? And then we built on. We did cross-references to other cross-references. So take our cross-reference, map it to FIX, map it to SWIFT, map it to FPML. And that gives you a structure to start actually looking at it. And we started using it to part of the thing earlier on. Now, the last step of this is really easy. Start. Don't hold off. If you've got a reasonable view of what it is, you'll get more and more insight in terms of what you need to do in your organization by starting and then going through an iteration process to actually get more and more value out of the data itself. Thank you. I'm going to move on now to talk a little bit about automation. We've talked about how much data there is that doesn't all have to have metadata. Philip, automation, how can people get to this stage and uh, what should it look like and what will it deliver? So I'm going to carry on from where Mark ended. Start. I mean, <laughs> you, you've, got to, you've got to start doing it. You, you have to, you know, really grasp the, the nettle. And um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to mean some changes in working practices, and that's something you cannot avoid. Uh, but actually, the recognition that once you have made those changes, you're going to be much better off is, is, is going to help drive that process. Uh, you're you're going to you're gonna have to recognize that as you do things, you're going to have to plan them properly by design and by default. You're going to have to make things happen um, in your code bases, in the technologies that you're using, as you as you touch a piece of code that, that drives a data change or touch a database that has data in it, you're going to have to classify it. If you if you make that a working practice, you're going to be able to scale this. The outcome should be that much like you drop a piece of ink onto some blotting paper, if, you know, or, you know, you, you you press the proverbial paint drum over you know a, a graphics package. Eventually, you will, you'll cover enough of the map that it'll make a difference. Okay, thank you very much indeed. And uh, coming to you, Mike, uh, talk a little bit about the types of tools, technologies, platforms that are useful here. 
Well, I can talk about five hours on that, so I'll just try to keep it brief. But um, I talked about some of that already. So, you know, we heard about lineage. I think we've heard a lot of us talk already about lineage. Lineage is super important for a number of reasons. It informs us where the data is coming from and where it's going to. Even if it has a different name, even if it has a different set of attributes, um, it's really important to understand the provenance of that data for a number of reasons. I had a CIO called me up a couple of months ago. We had an application that went down. Wanted to understand where the you know what the downstream effect is. A couple of years ago, we had some issues with some foreign sovereigns, uh, not at our bank, but you know we were you know there was concern around cybersecurity. If there was an attack on the financial um, system, where would it where who would, what would be impacted by the downstream pieces? There's line of business impact with lineage. Uh, not just regulatory, but line of business. So looking at things as simple as, you know, Bloomberg, how much Bloomberg data do we buy and how much, how ubiquitous is it throughout the organization? And do we need to find a way to remove it? UDTs. So these are things that are, you know, un these are undefined technologies that somebody built somewhere and that they're used for some unknown reason that they just sort of persist like dandelions in the, in the, in the landscape. Lineage helps us to find all of that. It helps us to inform us where things are coming from and going to uh, for a number of different reasons, from the provenance reasons, from the lines of business, from things like qualified finished contracts. And then there's catalog. So, you know, I think Philip said it or Mark said it or somebody said it that we have to understand what we need to understand. So part of that is just cataloging our data, doing, and, you know, we, we have a, a fairly significant catalog enterprise wide at BMY Mellon where we have a uh, kind of a handle on profiling our data. We do data domain profiling. We have taxonomies that we've identified. I think you need to identify and pick a couple of different taxonomies that fit your organization, whether it's product or account or client or whatever it might be, or security. Uh, you know, Reference data is a big deal. So you have to define those taxonomies. So data catalog is really important because now it helps you to understand not only what data you have, but the shape of your data, what the elements of the data are, are they authoritative data sources? Are they HCI, PII? Are they associated with um, you know, the business rules and the business logic? And then going to the business rules, you have to have a glossary. So the glossary, and it all has to tie together. If I'm looking at lineage, I wanna understand, do I have data quality issues, right? So I wanna look at the beginning part of my data lineage and say, from point of production, do I have a data quality issue that's going to persist throughout my entire organization? to things like regulatory reports, or even maybe billing. Maybe I've got a billing issue, uh, you know, um, obviously this is hypothetical, but maybe I have a billing issue and I need to understand why I have that. What's my, how much money am I leaving on the table? How do I you know, have this conversation with my clients? Um, you know, so the lineage, the catalog, the glossary, and of course the last piece of it is data quality. So I need to be able to understand, you know, what are my critical data elements that has to be identified through glossary and through catalog, and then how do I ensure that those are of the highest quality? So I have to measure them. I have to constantly revise that, whether it's through messaging technology or through CSVs or it's in Vertica or in Snowflake up in the cloud or what have you. You have to be able to have technologies that you can apply that allow, that allow you to do that. And then you have to have the entire picture brought together. So you can say, given a business role, what's my catalog profile look like? You know, what's the similarity to other data elements look like? What, what does my lineage diagram look or diagrams look like associated with that data element? And what are my quality rules? Where am I going on right and wrong? And then the final piece is the piece that I don't think anybody's doing right now, which is predictive. So I not only want to understand what happened, I want to understand what's going to happen. If I have if I have a data set of data quality um, rules against my lineage map, that I see that you know over time it's going out of quote unquote spec, that I'm going to have invalids where the rules are going to go off the you know off the two standard deviations from where I expect it to be. I want to be a priori. I want to be attacking that right away, rather than waiting until it occurs. So those are really the automation pieces, bringing that all together to create a complete picture of what's going on in your organization. Okay, fine. Philip, can I come back to you to talk uh, very much just about the technologies rather than what you're going to do? Well, obviously, you're going to talk about what they do, but you know what I mean. What, what do people need to be thinking about? Yeah. 
Well, well of course, I have a vested interest here. And, uh, you know, just, just briefly, I think the technologies need to be accessible. I, I, the, the, everybody is part of this. Everyone's creating data. Everyone's creating metadata all the time and everyone's creating context. So for me, for a solution to be useful, I'm, I was a practitioner, you know, someone who's an operational guy. I, it, it can't just be a theory-based solution. It has to be something that the enterprise can grasp and take ownership of. Uh, my favorite phrase of the month is everyone needs their fingerprints on it. So everyone needs their fingerprints on metadata and that must be true for the tooling. Okay. Mark, in terms of text, briefly. I'd love AI to be the only fingerprints on my data, but there we go. <laughs> I, I think the, the biggest tool is in your head. Okay. This is a mindset thing as much as anything else. Okay. Because look, from my perspective, it, many of us came from, from building systems. Yeah. Think about the evolution of just building systems. Code. You use version control. You have branches. Oh, isn't that lineage and impact analysis? Yeah. Okay. So we all get that. Then look at what happened with configuration. Config as code. Yeah, we need to control that. We do that. Isn't data the same? I mean, from my perspective, it is. I mean, if you look, think about the metadata, it's certainly easy to get to that point because if the metadata is wrong when you're using it, then guess what? It's exactly the same thing. Mike talked about lineage. It's impact analysis and predictive impact analysis between systems. The same disciplines that have been around for many years around code bases and have been around for many years around actually how we manage the environment and do dependency impact is exactly applicable to data. The trick is to realize that and then work out where we actually go from there. From my perspective, I look at the tooling and the, some of the best is obviously catalog is, is, is actually has to be done. And then observability platforms. There's really an interesting intersection between the quality of your data at a semantic level and actually being able to make sure that you can parse it and pattern match it appropriately to extract value. There's too much data to do most of this stuff manually, okay? So if you're going to get real value into your metadata, you have to form the metadata. To form the metadata, many of us require on carbon-based life forms, yeah? Now, the problem with that is it doesn't scale. So if, you're, if I was looking at one technology that holds out probably the biggest hope from my perspective, and it's not world hunger by any means, a lot of the NLP processing techniques that you're starting to see come out are actually extremely useful. Parsing documentations to extract schemas and definitions of fields at that type of level is actually specifically interesting and I think for many of us in this space. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna take a, a quick break. We have some audience questions we don't have long, so let's try and uh, get through these and uh, answer our delegates' questions. And uh, Mark, can I come back to you the first one? It says, we've, we've touched on this earlier, we have lots of diverse data sources which make it difficult to get metadata right. How should we approach this? Well, I mean, it's, first of all, if you know you've got m multiple data sources, then uh, frankly, write them down and then go back to the, 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 I mean, establish who the owners of that data are. I mean, this is, again, this goes back to normal data architecture practices. Establish a data owner, understand who's responsible for the quality of that data, make sure that they're aware they're responsible for the quality of that data, and then start cataloging and putting change management in place between that. That gives you the base discipline. And then within that, if you've got a, a reasonably, it may not be static, but at least you've got a controlled environment, then you can actually start doing the cross-referencing that Mike was talking about earlier, making sure that you know, a, a ISIN in one system is called an ISIN in another. Doesn't mean you have to change the name of the fields, but it does make sure there's a translation later, like a Rosetta Stone, if you like, for cross-references that exists in your organization to start thinking about it. So know your problem, establish your repo, establish basically control over that, and then start thinking about why you actually want to be able to join that stuff together and how you're going to control it. Okay, this is a very blunt one for you, Philip. We have data quality issues. What does that mean for metadata management? I think you've got, also, meta you've got metadata yes. quality issues. I know that, but where do you set the data quality level and things like that? I think it's part of the question, probably. Yeah. It's, it's going to be subjective. Uh, at the end of the day, data quality means different things to different people. Um, the, the reality is, is it's all context driven. You need to understand the context in order, in order to understand where your data quality issues are. Um, bringing it back to metadata and lineage and, and governance, there has to be some levers in the organization that give you the, the understanding of, of what quality really means. So if you've done all of that and you still have quality issues, then it's, it's everything that, that Mark was talking about. Go and identify the data owners. Get okay. them to fix stuff. Okay, so some really basic things to yeah, do. Yeah, no, there. it's first it's first principle stuff. Right. 
Okay. Antara, last one for you. Um, and it says, metadata is important across our organization, but no one outside IT really wants to hear about it. How can we make people aware of it and how useful it can be, or are we just wasting our time? Um, it's a great question, actually. And I think this kind of comes back to the reasons why um, a lot of metadata projects fail, <laughs> in a way. Um, the thing is, people within organizations tend to think about metadata only within the IT world and as part of solving one specific problem statement within one application. The response to this is metadata management has to be seen as a strategy within your organization. And a lot of organizations fail to see that. So look at it as a strategy, which is embedded as part of your overall data strategy. So make sure it is evangelized at that level because data on its own and the data strategy touches upon everyone within the organization. And one of the major um, effects of a good metadata management is the democratization of data. And that also means that people without having a lot of IT knowledge should be able to access that data. So if you can really translate this, this benefit and you know, convey this benefit to the users of data, I think they would start seeing what are the advantages of it and um, you know, start getting on board with, with, with this whole metadata approach of management that you want to take. So can I just add one thing? Mm. It's like the, the most obvious thing to do, everybody, is when there's a problem, and there are plenty of problems in all of our organizations, either now or over the years, use it. Show that it's linked, causally linked. If that, if, that, if, that, if that unit change caused an error in trading, point it out. Point out that the fact, don't hide this, that that's a unit change. That would have been caught if you'd had notifications. If there's an ISIN misclassification, that would have been checked if you'd checked your ISIN data. And that would have been easier to do if you'd known it was actually a security ID to validate. Your screw ups, frankly, are the best source of action in many firms. So if you can actually trace those back to a data problem, and there's a lot of times it is a data problem, then you can trace it to a metadata problem or a metadata opportunity that could have solved it. It's a very, if you like, more straightforward. It can be a little bit, you know, strap on your body armor type stuff, but it is a good way of getting attention and solving the problems that your organization's facing. And, and let's remember what metadata companies are out there. Facebook, Google, Amazon, they are metadata companies. They're not data companies, they're metadata companies. They are trading off metadata. They're massively successful. So I couldn't agree with Tara more. The value is there, and it is, unfortunately, in some companies, seen as an IT thing, right? But Google, Facebook, Amazon, metadata companies, that's what they are. Okay, we are so close to the end of time that I'm going to come to our final point today. And, uh, yep, I'd like to uh, ask a couple of our speakers to provide some guidance for people who are working on metadata management. Uh, Mike, can you say a few words here? Started. It's never too late. Okay, that's a few words, Tara, a few words. <laughs> um, I think I'm just going to be the fact that make sure it's a strategy and not a one-time implementation. That's the strategy embedded within your company. And, and, and yeah. sorry, I have to say this, make sure you focus on the conceptual and semantic metadata because that's a piece that's missing in many, many organizations when we're talking about metadata. Okay, and some final words from you, Philip. Well, the echo chamber continues. Start it. It's a strategy. Don't lose the faith. Honestly, <laughs> it's it's the key to it's the key. I, I sat there as a person before kind of this this metadata crisis, the metadata trauma began, watching data grow and lamenting the fact that that I couldn't make the business understand it. And then there are businesses based around it. So keep the faith. OK, and get started. Good luck, everybody. And thank you very much to all of you, all our speakers and our sponsors for today. And obviously, thank you to Bloomberg, Solidatis and Crux for sponsoring today's webinar. It's been a very good conversation, which I think could have uh, gone on some time longer. Before we close up, just a quick note that if you scroll down your screen to additional options, you'll see some 18 resources that may be of interest. You can download our 2021 regulatory handbook, register for our next webinar on managing unstructured data to ensure regulatory compliance and gain business value, or download our ESG handbook 2021. On which subject, we're very excited. We've recently launched a new content service called ESG Insight, which is dedicated to all things ESG, not surprisingly.
and on your screen you can see where you can access that uh, channel and where you can sign up to uh, receive content from us on that. That said, thank you very much indeed. That's all for today. Thank you to Tara, Philip, Mike, Edgar and Mark and thank you to all of you who have taken part in the webinar. Please come complete our feedback form as we're always keen to hear your views and improve our products. Great conversation, everybody. Thank you very much indeed and goodbye. <laughs>